Well, good morning. It is really good to see you here today. Glad that you are here. Um, this is the time in the service when we come together and we look at God's word. And we take seriously that what the Bible says is God's word to us. Um, so it's important as we look at scripture that what we try to do is not just find these little helpful nuggets to live, although those are there. But we want to know what is God saying to us? What is the point? What's he trying to communicate? And so that's what we do this morning when we come together during this time of the service. We really try to think through what is God communicating to us. Um, has anyone here ever made the drive from here to the West Coast? Um, I used to make that drive all the time. And I did it for years and years because uh, my family was in Oregon and I was at school in Dallas. And I've made the drive when the speed limit was 55. I've made the drive when the speed limit was 75. And here's the thing that I've discovered on the drive. And if you've ever made this drive, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are points on that drive where there is some kind of dark force at work. It's usually around the time that I've passed the 300th tumbleweed. Something comes into my car and takes over. And it is not possible to go as slow as the speed limit. It doesn't matter if the speed limit was 55 or 75. It's like my car was a greyhound chasing a rabbit. And that is where I learned the theory of speeding. The theory of speeding goes like this. If you're going to break the law, make sure that someone else is breaking the law worse than you are. <laughs> or make sure you're not in the red car. What I have found in my own Christian life is that there's something very similar at operate, that operates within me. That when I sing a song like Jesus paid it all, there's a part of me that doesn't really believe that. And I live with a theory of sinning. And my theory of sinning is that if I'm going to do something wrong, make sure that someone else around me is doing something worse or I'm not the most obvious person doing it. And I think that might be the predominant way our culture thinks about how you relate to God. If you want God on your side, if you want God to approve of you, if you want to be in God's favor, then the goal is to do Less bad things and more good things than maybe someone else. It's like we believe that God grades on a curve. And for those of you who have not yet experienced the joy of grading on a curve, let me explain what that is. That means when you take a test in school, you're being graded not against some standard. You're being graded against all the other students. If you get half the questions right, and all the other students get 75% of the questions wrong, you're in good shape. But if you get half the questions right, and the rest of the students get 75% of the questions right, you're in trouble. You are not going to pass that test, even though it's the exact same score in both scenarios. 
And we tend to do the same thing with God. We think God ranks us from the nicest down to the meanest. And at some point, somewhere above Hitler and below me, there's a cutoff. And this thinking gets into our churches, it gets into our own Christian lives, and when it does, as we're going to see in today's passage, it compromises our mission and it compromises our identity. And today we're going to look at the version of that that says, what God approves of, what God is looking for, is for me to be more religious than them. Now, we're in our fourth week in our series on Romans. And if you remember, just some of the background on Romans, Romans was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Rome. It's a church that he had never visited. The church had been founded by a group of Jews, but over the course of years, Gentiles had become Christians. Gentiles is a word for non-Jews. Gentiles had become Christians, and they became a part of the church. And about 16 years after the church was founded... The emperor of Rome said, all the Jews need to get out of Rome. And so that left the Gentiles in charge of the church. When the Jews came back, you now have a church that looks less Jewish than when they left it and a lot more Gentilish. And so the question is, what's the church supposed to look like? What's right How's it supposed to work? And there's conflict between these two groups. And Paul, to resolve this conflict, basically says, you don't understand the gospel, so I'm going to teach you the gospel all over again. And we saw that Paul does this by dividing the book into two parts. The first part is that God gives righteousness. That's chapters 1 through 11. The second part is the righteous, those who have received the righteousness that God gives, live by faith. That's 12 through the end of the book. We are in this very first section after the introduction. What is the need for righteousness? And Paul develops this in four sections. He starts off by saying that God's wrath is just for every, is just for every person. And so the Gentiles who are sitting in that church are saying, we never had God's law. How can you judge us by that? By that? Paul is saying God is absolutely just. He has revealed enough to you that he can judge you for that. And then he turns to the Jews, and we saw this the last time. God's wrath is just in its final execution, and that execution is coming. A day of judgment is coming, and that day of judgment is going to hold you Jews accountable, even though culturally you lived wonderful Jewish lives. This week, he's looking at the exact same audience, and he's talking to the Jews again, and he's upped the ante a little bit. God's wrath is just for everyone, including you Jews, even to those who have lived a religiously, not just cultural, but a religiously Jewish life. Paul's argument is that everyone fails to meet the standard of righteousness and is therefore in need of God to give them that righteousness. That's where he's going in this section. That's what he's doing in the book of Romans. And it's important to keep that in mind. Otherwise, we misinterpret a whole bunch of what's going on in today's passage. Last time we, we got together, I keep saying thinking last week, but last week we had the missions conference, which was fantastic, by the way. Um, and uh, But last time we got together, we saw that Paul used a very interesting teaching tool. He introduced an imaginary friend. Paul introduced a person that he's having a debate with. It's a made-up person, but this person represents the Jewish perspective. And you really just hear Paul's side of the argument, but you can see that, that that's what he's doing. That was actually a common feature of literature back then, and it was a very powerful way of Paul making his point. And this debate partner represented the Jewish perspective in the church that righteousness meant being Jewish. So if God grades on a curve, they would say the way to get to the top of the curve, the way to get to the top of the class was to be Jewish and do Jewish things. 
Last time it was the emphasis on Jewish culture. This time it's the emphasis on Jewish religion. And Paul is going to show that this thinking has caused them to compromise their mission that God gave them. It has caused them to compromise their identity that God has given them. And it's even caused them to raise questions about whether God is fair. Paul starts with the idea that their disobedience, all of their disobedience, even as people who are Jewish, even as people who do all of the culture and religious things, their disobedience, even theirs, undermines the mission that God has given them. Remember what the Jewish mission was. It was to represent God to the world in a way that drew people to God. And Paul is saying in these verses that how they lived has caused them to fail at the mission. But that's not what Paul's invisible debater thinks about himself. Look at how he thinks about himself. He calls himself a Jew and he relies on the law. This word rely literally means to take comfort in, to lean on for support. He's someone who boasts in God. He brags about who God is. He knows God's will. He even approves of the things that are truly important, truly valuable. These are people of God's word is what he's saying in these two verses. If one of them showed up at Longview Today, there's a good chance they would come to our church because they would love the name of our church. We are Fellowship Bible Church. That's who these people were. They were more than that. They're not just people who know God's word. They are people who teach God's word. They're called guides. They're a light. They're instructors. They're teachers. Who do, these do the, who do they do these things for? Guide to the blind, those who are in darkness, the foolish, children. Is he talking about children's ministry? Um, probably not, because I didn't have children's ministry back then. But um, I think who he's talking about are the people that they're sent on mission to reach. Right, They're sent on mission to reach the Gentiles who are blind to God's word. They live in darkness. They are foolish about the ways of God. They lack understanding, experience, and insight about the ways of God. These are the people that they are to reach. And so you can imagine how this Jewish debate or this Jewish mindset works. These are the religiously superior people. Who's the superior person? The professor who has a PhD in his discipline and is teaching the discipline to college freshmen who are just learning it. Who's at the top of the curve? The professor. And that's exactly how these Jewish folks thought. We are the top of the curve. We are the professors to the Gentiles. We are the experts in this field of knowledge. We are the experts in God's word and we teach it. There's a problem, and here's the problem. They don't learn the lessons that they teach. You who teach others, do you not teach yourself? The implication is no, they don't. They do all the things that they tell other people not to do. That's the point of verse 22 with this list of sins. These are all things that they say are wrong, but they turn around and they do them. It's like the chemistry teacher who says, whatever you do, don't take this liquid and pour it into that liquid because it will blow up the school. And all the students say, okay, and they leave the classroom. And then the teacher blows up the school. That's the picture here. He's saying, this is exactly what you do. You claim to be experts in in God's word. You're teachers of God's word, but you don't do the very things that you're supposed to. You do the very things you tell people not to. And the result is staggering. The name of God 
is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The word blasphemed means to revile something. It it means to defame something. It means to, in an angry way, in a brutal way, criticize God. These Gentiles are looking at these experts in God's word, these people who teach God's word, and they see how they live. And when they see how they live, they say about their God brutal, critical things. It's interesting to ask ourselves the question, what do people think about God when they look at our lives? I heard the story um, years ago. I think it was in college when this person told me this story. Um, This person who told me this story was at a restaurant with a very well-known Christian speaker. I don't even know who the Christian speaker was. He never told me. Uh, This person who apparently wrote lots of books was a major kind of Christian culture warrior in society, defending what is right in biblical standards and inspiring Christians to do the same. And this guy that was telling me this story was at a restaurant with this famous Christian speaker. And this famous Christian speaker was relentlessly cruel to the waitress. Just picked on her again and again and again. And the guy telling me this story got so frustrated that as the meal was ending, He looked at this speaker and said, why don't you try telling her about Jesus now? See, here's the danger of thinking that God grades on a curve. We think that God grades on a curve. Our goal will be more knowledgeable, more moral than the people around us. So we stay out of trouble with God. I think that's how that Christian speaker thought. The problem was that's not the standard. And that standard only leads to failure in our mission. Our goal is to reflect the character of God so well that people will see it and they will want more. They will want God himself. The standard isn't the people we are supposed to reach. The standard is the character of God. And so we have to ask ourselves, as we live amongst the people that we are supposed to reach, as we interact with them, as we talk with them, even if they are our enemies, does our lives undermine our mission? Because we're just satisfied being a little bit better than them. Not only does that way of thinking undermine our mission, it undermines our very identity itself. And that's where Paul is going next with this. If you see someone in a police uniform, what do you assume? Supposing it's not Halloween. That they're part of the police force, right? What else do you assume? You assume that if they're a part of the police force, they live by a certain code. They live by a certain standard, and that code is captured in things like protect and serve. So if you see someone in a police uniform, you assume that they're a part of a group, a police force, you assume that they have a certain code, protect and serve. My dad was a police officer in Los Angeles, California in the early 70s. Those of you who are alive, remember the early 70s? part of Los Angeles called Watts was burning itself down. Uh, and that's where my dad was a police officer, was in Watts. And his partner became the first police officer in the history of the state of California to be convicted of murder committed while in uniform. My dad had to turn him in, testify against him, which is you can imagine, a very traumatic thing to do. 
But here's the thing. When people figured out what my dad's partner had actually done, they didn't say, look, the man wears a uniform. So what he does shouldn't matter. He's got the uniform. He can do whatever he wants. No, the uniform is a symbol. It's a representation of who you're supposed to be, who you're, what you're supposed to be about. And when you violate that, when you give that up, the uniform becomes meaningless. And my dad's partner had to be held accountable. If you can think in those terms, as Paul starts talking about circumcision, that's exactly the sort of thing, that's the sort of debate that he has in mind. See, in verse 25, Paul is saying that circumcision is valuable if you keep the code, if you live by the code. But if you break it, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Now, if you're really going to understand this, you have to understand what circumcision meant in that time. You have to understand why this was a big deal. Circumcision was like this major dividing line. In fact, in the time of Paul, it was the major division between Jews and Gentiles. How do you know someone is a Jew? What is the defining mark? How can you tell? What is the physical symbol? What is their police uniform? Circumcision. And circumcision, according to the Old Testament, was also supposed to tell you something about the heart. That's why as you read through the Old Testament, you'll see again and again and again, it talks about circumcision of the heart. Circumcision was supposed to represent that this was a person and these were a people who had a heart for God. And when you get that in mind, you start looking at the word circumcision and you, and you replace it with, this is the physical sign of the people with a heart for God. And you go to this passage and it starts to make sense. For the physical, for the people with a physical representation of a heart with God, it's valuable if they actually obey the law. But if they break the law, your physical representation of a heart for God is just like you don't have that. It's like you don't have the uniform. And then Paul creates two hypothetical people. He's got people who have the, who, people who have the sign but break the law, and then people who don't have the sign but keep the law. And Paul is saying if you have the sign and break the law, the sign is meaningless. If you don't have the sign and you keep the law, it's just like you have the sign. And then verse 27 would have absolutely blown the Jews in the audience away. You're telling me that those people who don't have the physical mark of being a part of Jewishness, they actually, there is a scenario where they will judge and condemn those of us who do. That's exactly what Paul is saying. That there is a scenario that is conceivable where someone would so keep the law, so would obey the law, someone would do it so perfectly, even though they're a Gentile, that they would be able to condemn someone who didn't. Now, this is why we've got to remember the context. Paul is not saying, now, therefore, you go out and keep the law perfectly, because that's not possible. He's setting up an argument. Paul is not saying that it's, it's possible to work hard enough and be righteous enough by keeping all the rules. He's creating the argument that there are two paths that you can live. You can live by trying to keep the law perfectly, and if you do, you will live righteously. You can try to keep the law perfectly, and if you don't, you will be unrighteous. And Paul's whole point here is that nobody does this. Everyone follows this path. What he's trying to do in these verses is tell the Jew, look, your Jewishness doesn't excuse you and get you out of not keeping the law. Just because you do all of these wonderful, incredible rituals and practices, it doesn't make up for you not being righteous. 
verses 28 and 29 are really the point of this, pa- this paragraph. The mark of being someone who is a part of the people of God is not outward. It's not the uniform. It's what's going on inwardly. It's someone whose heart is dedicated to being transformed by God. So you see, here's the argument that's at play. Paul's debate buddy is saying, all they need to do is put on the uniform, have the mark of being a part of God's people. Then that covers anything wrong that they do. That puts them at the top of the curve. And Paul's answer is, no, it doesn't. The grade is always, always based on your righteousness. And as he is arguing, none of us have the righteousness to make the grade. By the way, this should sound a lot like Jesus. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 7. There's going to be a lot of people who would call him Lord, Lord. They would do all kinds of incredible things to prove that Jesus was their Lord. But Jesus will say to them that he never knew them. Why? Because in Matthew 7, it says they were lawless. So here's the question. What do you think, really, what do you really think is the mark of your Christianity? Do you think the mark of your Christianity is going to church? It's what sticker you have on your car? It's carrying your Bible around with you? Nothing wrong with those things. But there are a lot of people who will call themselves followers of Jesus and try to mark themselves off as followers of Jesus by doing everything except for one thing. Follow Jesus. They won't think like him. They won't value what he values. They won't relate to people the way that he did. They won't care about his mission. These people think that just because they call themselves a follower of Jesus and have the outward signs, Jesus is going to give them a pass. Paul's saying here, no, he won't. The debater's final argument is that God isn't fair if he doesn't grade on a curve. And Paul is going to respond that that's not true, that God's response to sin is righteous and faithful and faithful and it's righteous and faithful because he doesn't grade on a curve. You see in verse 1 of chapter 3 the debater is questioning God's faithfulness. If he doesn't give the Jews special treatment, see what is the advantage of being a Jew? What's the value of circumcision? What's behind those questions? What's behind those questions is that God had made promises to his people in the form of a covenant. And one of those promises, it was that God would be their people. And so now this Jewish debater is is raising the question, what's happened to those promises? He specifically says in verse 3, does does the lack of faith, the faithlessness of your people, does that take away your faithfulness to your promises? Does their faithfulness triumph over your faithfulness, God? God? Here's what this would sound like in our church today. If going to church, if sacrificially serving and giving, if being a part of youth group or Bible study, if if trying to do all these things that, that make me look like a follower of Jesus, if they don't make me better off than other people in God's eyes, then why do it? And Paul's answer is in verse 2. The advantage is that you are entrusted with the oracles of God. The advantage is that you are given God's word. Look at it this way. Suppose you have two guys that are in every way identical, that are both interested in the same girl. But one guy has access to her Facebook profile and her Facebook page, and the other one doesn't. Who 
has got the lead? Who has the advantage of actually having a relationship with this girl? It's the one who knows about her, what she enjoys, what she's like, how she thinks, what she values. And that's what Paul is saying here. The people with God's word can know what God is like, and that's a huge advantage. We go to church, we serve, we do these things because by them we know God better. Not because by them we move up the curve. Verse 4 can be confusing. It's helpful to know that he's quoting Psalm 51, and in Psalm 51, the you is God. Psalm 51 is saying here that God, when you look at his words, when you look at what he's done, if you want to try to, con to, to accuse him of being unfair, it will never stand. God will be justified. God will be proved to be faithful. God will be proved to be true to his word. The last verses argue that the righteousness of God should mean that everyone should get an A. It says in verse 5 that if our unrighteousness, our sin, shows the righteousness of God, what's the problem? Why should God punish us for that? Verse 7 gives a specific example. If my lie brings out God's truth, why am I condemned as a sinner for lying? Right? It's a way of saying that sin can't be that bad because of looking a whole lot of time talking about how it affects the people being gossiped about, but that's another, that's another subject. You say this is wrong, our culture says, but look at all the good that comes out of it. And Paul's answer is that if everything is good, how could God judge the world? If everything is good, then there's no basis for judgment is what Paul is saying here. And that sounds really good at first until that gets applied to you. Someone steals your car. Hey, that's a good thing. No problem. Someone oppresses the poor. Someone is a racist. Hey, that's a good thing. Paul's saying, no, it's not. Paul's saying, absolutely not, it's a good thing. It is evil, it is bad, and God has a right to call those things evil and bad. But if we treat everything as just an opportunity for, for God to show that he's righteous and therefore it must be good, then nothing is bad. If God gives everyone an A, then God is not righteous and he is not faithful to care for anyone. You see, the debate partner's fundamental error is that he uses the wrong standard for judging righteousness. He made the standard how they compare to other people. And we do the same thing all the time. We say things like, God, look at how our world is falling apart. And inside we are saying, at least I'm not like them. We say, God, look at how those Christians are behaving. And we say, at least I am not like them. And we live, even as Christians, as if God grades on a curve. And when we do that, it puts tremendous pressure on all of us. Because we are constantly trying to live to be better than the people around us so that we can earn God's favor. It looks something like this. We say to ourselves, look at how great I am. I'm even a teacher of God's word. I'm better than that person who just goes to the church, but the person who goes to the church is better than that person who obeys, I don't know, 70% of the time, but never really walks into a church. And that person's kind of proud of himself because he's better than this person who only obeys 50% of the time. And we live constantly trying to make sure that our mountain is higher than everyone else's. And we live 
with that stress and with that pressure. And we say to ourselves, if anyone has earned God's love, it's me. And here's the reality. This is that exact same set of pictures just scaled down. And it's scaled down to the point where when you put it next to this mountain, you can't even see that there are differences in the sides of those mountains. When you stop comparing yourself to one another, and you start comparing yourself to the righteousness of God, the things that we thought were huge differences between us are meaningless compared to God's righteousness. God's righteousness is the standard. We are so proud of our differences between one another. We are so proud of how we are not like those sinners. But in fact, our best moments of righteousness will always, always be only imperfect illustrations of true righteousness. Our best moments of righteousness are always a mixture of motives. We debate over which sins are the worst. And it's true that there are different sins that have different consequences. But at some level, that debate shows that we don't really get reality. So what that you're not greedy? And greed could do a lot of damage to a lot of people. So what that you're not greedy? But you tend to make yourself look better than you are in conversations with people. The difference between those two is insignificant when you are comparing it to the righteousness of God. Is there anything to be proud of by saying, yeah, I build myself up at the expense of others, but I'm not greedy. It's easy to keep this passage theoretical, even philosophical. And that's actually going to be a challenge as we go through the entire first 11 chapters. Paul is doing theology here. But this passage invites us to do some very deep soul work if we are willing to go there. For me, the form of the question, the, the question that it took this week was, why do I work so hard to build myself up by comparing myself to others? Do you ever do that when you watch the news? How horrible they are? Do you ever do that with your coworkers or people at school? Glad I'm not like them. Do you ever do that in your home with your spouse, or with your parents, or with your children? I can't believe they did that. I would never. Even if we never say it out loud, our hearts scream, at least I'm not like you. We are trying to convince ourselves that we are acceptable to God, to others and ourselves because we're better than other people. Stop and think what you're really doing when you do that. You are denying that Jesus paid it all. And you are saying that somewhere it's up to you to climb the curve. We never say it out loud, but we think, I have to be acceptable to God because if I'm not, then no one is. And guess what Paul's point is? No one is. So what's the cure? The cure is trust, genuine trust. Trust that God is our righteousness and that we are not. We have to trust that God can be completely just, perfectly righteous, and unfailingly faithful all at the same time. We have to trust that God's standard can be perfect righteousness that we can never attain, no matter how we compare to one another. We can trust that God can apply that standard completely and justly to me, and we can trust that God is still faithful. How is that possible? Paul is going to answer that question in the weeks ahead. But here's a spoiler alert. It's possible because of what Jesus has done for you. It's possible 
because of Jesus' death and resurrection, when we become followers of Christ, when we become people who say we want to be like him and be in relationship with him, all of Jesus' perfect righteousness gets credited to us, and we can stop playing the games of comparing ourselves to one another. This is really Paul's point in this chapter. Trust that God's justice doesn't change his faithfulness and righteousness. Now, we can't just manufacture trust. If we were to leave here today and I were to ask you, just go trust more, that would actually be cruel because you can't do that. So what I want us to do is have a stop living in this horrible pattern of comparing ourselves to our friends and to our enemies and to our family members and to everyone else by doing a few things that help us to grow the trust that we need to do that. And that's what this week's responses are designed to do. They're designed to help us come face to face with God's justice and his righteousness and discover his faithfulness in the midst of that. That's why I encourage you to rewrite Romans, this, the whole book, but certainly this section in your own words. Get down to what is he really saying? We don't think about circumcision in the way that they do, but we think about a lot of other things the way that they did. These are the markers that we say that put on the uniform of who we are to declare to the world that we are Christians. What are those things that we substitute instead of faithfulness with God? Put that in your own words. Share with someone where you tend to question God's righteousness and faithfulness, just like Paul's debate partner. Practice daily confession to the Lord. This causes us to confront the reality that God does not grade on a curve. The standard is his righteousness, and we fail. They are still battling that they need to outperform those around them. If you're in one of those two groups, one of the best things you could do is just come pray with someone who will stand with you and support you. And we're going to have a group of people up here who will do that at the end. Or on your care card or yeah, connection card, just make a note that this is me. This is my struggle. Slip it in one of the boxes that are in the foyer to my right or to my left. And you see, there's a third group here. There's a third group who have been battling this for a long time. When I talk about that struggle inside of them to try to outperform everyone else to get God's favor, they know exactly what I'm talking about, and they have wrestled with it for years, and they have found victory, and they have found defeat, and they are people I look to and say, there are people in this room who need your help. There are people in this room who need your wisdom. You're not perfect. You're still struggling with it, but you're further along in the battle. Look around, pay attention. Are you entering into relationships with people around you that you can be of help? I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. And we're going to close in prayer. And I want to encourage you that as they come forward, it doesn't matter what you need prayer with. If, if, if you need prayer because you are struggling with God grading on a curve, these are he- people here to pray with you. But if you're struggling with finances or relationships or you're just spiritually exhausted, allow these people to come pray with you. Let's stand and let's close in prayer. Father, we come to you in confession. Our best efforts at righteousness are insignificant. Father, forgive us for comparing ourselves to each other. Forgive us for building ourselves up at others' expense. Forgive us for thinking that our insignificant righteousness is enough for a perfectly righteous God. And Lord, we thank you that you forgive us. We thank you that you see your children, the followers of Christ, through the lens of Jesus' righteousness. Lord, help us to trust you more. Help that trust to be evident in how we treat one another in our families, how we treat one another in our friendships, in work, and in our community. Lord, may people look at us and say they are not striving 
the way that I am. They are not competing the way that I am. They are not putting others down the way that I am. What is going on? Lord, help our lives to be the mark, to be the uniform that we put on that says we are a follower of Christ. And Lord, we thank you for that help even today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me leave you with what the passage has said about who our God is. It is said that God is perfectly righteous and he is unfailingly faithful. So your charge as you leave here is this. Stop trying to impress God and everyone else with how good you are. Go and grow your trust in him. You are dismissed.